Welcome to the Up Arrow Podcast with William Harris, featuring top business leaders sharing strategies and resources to get to the next level. Now, let's get started with the show. Hey everybody, it's William Harris here, the founder and CEO of Element and the host of this podcast where I feature experts in the D2C industry sharing strategies on how to scale your business and achieve your goals. Excited about the guest that I have today, Marianne Zachauer. Marianne is the co-founder and CEO of OrderBot, an order and inventory management company. She's a source of optimism and a catalyst of growth with over 25 years experience in B2C, B2B, e-commerce, process, and system efficiencies. Her expertise lies in envisioning solutions to complex customer challenges and building exceptional teams to deliver suggested increased productivity and growth enablers. She is a balance between the corporate and entrepreneurial worlds uh, Marianne, very excited to have you here today. Thank you for having me, William. I am more excited. Yeah, oh, well, good. That's good. Uh, <laughs> and I want to make sure that we give a shout out to Linda Bustos for introducing us. Linda is just another brilliant mind in the e-commerce space, somebody that I feel is just a, a, a light and a breath of fresh air and uh, uh, not she surprised indeed. that she would also know you. Yes, yes, she's indeed. She's my neighbor here in Vancouver. <laughs> I love it. So before I uh, jump into the backstory here, because we're going to talk a lot about the inventory management and, and, and stuff here too, I do want to announce our sponsorship. This episode is brought to you by Element. Element is an award-winning advertising agency optimizing e-commerce campaigns around profit. In fact, we've helped 13 of our customers get acquired with the largest one selling for nearly $800 million, And we were ranked as the 12th fastest growing agency in the world by Adweek. You can learn more on our website at element.com, E-L-U-M-Y-N-T.com. That said, enough of the boring stuff, on to the fun stuff. Marianne, why did you start OrderBot? What made you say, this is the thing that I'm passionate about and I want to pour into and that the, the world needs right now? Oh, thank you for asking this question because I love it. Uh, I was, this is over 20 years ago, William. I was director of IT in one of my favorite cities in the world in San Francisco, and mm. I was running all the technology of Boudin Bakeries. We sold bread in a basket and sold it all over the world, had 52 cafes, sales reps on the road selling to different cafes as well, and four bakeries. And one of the businesses, after I had <clears throat> set up their inventory management and after I set their point of sale and a lot of systems upgrades and to best of breed, after that, the big question was, how are we going to increase our sales online? And how are we going to be able to manage going from a million dollars in sales to multi-million dollars in sales in no time. And I, it just took me one day at the warehouse to, to try and help them out. And I realized that their plan of spending $75,000 20 years ago, that was a lot of money, $75,000 on a website to make it prettier and sexier, was not going to cut it because we were not able to deliver consistently and reliably. Sure. And with every order, the 10 orders that went out, 25% of them, fail to either be delivered on time or wow. have the right inventory to them. So we'd have to call customers and try and get them to change their mind to a different item. And I was like, how can you grow your sales like that? And yeah. one of the big things, if you were to put one label on me as a person, is reliability. So I have a really hard time selling or committing to a sale unless I know I can fulfill it. So I, I kept thinking, what can we do to make this more reliable? 20 years ago, there was no back-end e-commerce. There was nothing. There was inventory sure. management, yes, but we had so many different channels. We had online orders. Yeah. We had all our cafes ordering. We had sales reps on the road ordering for corporate gifts. We had a huge amount of channels coming through. And by the time the orders came in, inventory was already wrong. And, you know, so I thought, why don't we build it? <laughs> yeah. And that's what happened. We built it, saw the success, and I just I just was so excited. I, I knew because I had searched for six months that there was nothing like it and uh, decided then to kind of like, I've accomplished my mission with Boudin, got them to best of breed, got every area of them to be growth oriented. And this is the time to come and take this to many more potential customers out there. Yeah, and so this was born out of an actual real pain that you felt personally, and and I think that's one of the best ways to start a company is being able to look at something and saying, this is a problem that I need solved, doesn't exist, how do I solve this? And uh, you took that and ran with that, and now you guys are working with absolutely massive companies. Um, why does this matter even more at scale? One of the things we talked about was, you know, how, you know, you, you when you grow this, sure, 25% on, on small orders matters. 
that I, and, and you know, large, large companies, this matters even more. What are some of the problems that large companies are dealing with um, and, and why, how this solves? Yeah, so you're right. And you know what? This matters for small and it matters more and more and more and more as your volume grows. So for the smaller ones, it's a matter of connection. There's no company sure. anymore that doesn't have two systems talking to each other. You want to have a front end and a back end. They need to be connected. They need to be talking to each other. If your volumes are low, you can catch an error pretty fast because you're, you only have maybe 100 orders a day and you're fine. But think about a company. We work with Staples Canada, for example, that has, or we worked with Live Nation. We worked with many bigger companies who had very, 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 very large volumes. Think mm -hmm. about... You know, Live Nation did merchandising and there's Harry Styles who tweeted something, 37,000 orders in less than an hour. Who's going to wow. sift through problems that happen, right? And yeah. think about like all the orders coming through in a very high volume state. If you're not equipped to update inventory at the millisecond level, you're not going to get inventory right. And you're going to mm -hmm. take another 37,000 orders because it hasn't updated your inventory. So this, yeah. this, this example was, you know, luckily one channel, so a bit less complicated. But the minute you have Staples has multiple channels, they sell corporate, they sell online, they release a PS4, that some people are ordering it B2C, B2B, huge number of volumes. If you're not updating in a millisecond, forget it. Now you have a bunch of oversold. Now you have people... On customer service, their phones are ringing nonstop because, you know, they haven't delivered. Now, there's a cost of customer service. There's a cost of yeah. credit cards that you need to refund and bad, you know, bad uh, omen. Like you've just sold a bunch of stuff, got a bunch of people excited that they're going to. Who doesn't have a 17 year old? And I have a 17 year old son who's waiting for the PS4. And then they get an email that says you're not getting it, you know. So, yeah. yeah. So it's so important, uh, you know, at, at, especially at, at volume. Well, you talked about the cost, and I think that's something that maybe we don't um, talk about often enough. You know, first of all, there's to your point, like there's the the cost of the the customer itself feeling frustrated, and that's a that's a really big deal. Your son, then, you know, he's excited to get the PS4, and all of a sudden he's not getting it, and that's irritating. And you, as a mom, and, and just all of your time, and so there's there's cost there, but it's a soft cost, right? But then there are actual, very real costs that are involved in this as well. And not just opportunity lost, but actual costs that are involved. And one of the things you mentioned was um, the cost of the customer service team having to deal with this. That's an actual, very real, tangible cost that, that has to go into it. What are some of the other costs that people are maybe not um, calculating when they're thinking about the accuracy of their uh, order management system? I, I think it's funny because it's been years we've been working on an ROI calculator on our website. And it's so hard to quantify all the costs because you not only have <clears throat> the, the marketing effort that you have put on your effort that has now gone wasted. Now sure. you've taken in a bunch of orders that you have taken them on. That means you have paid someone for a per order volume to process mm -hmm. all these orders, whether you're on Shopify, anywhere you are, they charge you on a per order on a certain volume level. You're sure. on order box, we count the volume. Now that all this is counted as volume and there is a processing element, there's hosting fees, there's all that stuff. And now the, the customer gets the email saying they don't, they don't, they're calling in a call center, whether you're doing call in call center, whether you're doing chats, all that is also expensive. And the volumes, sometimes the volumes are so high, you can't even keep up with it. And then the worst one, the one that bothers me is also like the hard physical dollar cost as well, as well as customer service of like credit cards. Credit cards has taken, you know, to whatever percent of your transaction. You're not getting that money back. Um, oh, and, sure. and the unmeasurable cost of, you know, unhappy customers and non-return, they go to another website and now you lost them. And they're like, I'm not going to go back to this company next time. So yeah. it's, 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 it's a big cost. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. <laughs> How do people evaluate whether or not uh, their current order management system um, is adequate for where they're at, whether there's problems? And so, you know, I'm thinking about this and, and let's say somebody's on Shopify and they're, they're running their store and they may know that this is happening to some degree, but maybe they don't have as deep of insight into knowing that, oh, this is an issue for me right now. What are the, what are the first metrics they can start looking at or where can they look to see just how big of an issue this is for them. Um, and, and maybe they already have an order management system and they're looking at this, trying to see, is this 
doing a good enough job for me or, or do I need to change things up here? What are those types of metrics or where are they looking to find those reports? You know, William, I guarantee you, I'm going to take a guess, but I'm, on, I'm ready to guarantee <laughs> that most companies don't really necessarily know where the true problems are. So sure. if you talk about KPI, the best way to measure this is when did your customer order? What was your SLA? Did you commit first? Are you able to commit? Sure. Or are you one of these companies who's like, I'm too scared to commit the time because who knows when they're going to get it. So some of the companies are still there. And then there are the companies who are being braver and who are saying, no, I'm going to commit to a timeline. And, and now I need to measure when did they order? Did they receive it without timeline? And take your order percentage. So when we, when we took on bigger customers, um, you know, they were at 80%. We call this the perfect order, and we have dashboards to show that. And we took them to ninety nine point nine eight percent. Wow! The big, yeah, this is very exciting. I love I love what I do because I feel the tangible results, and I feel again if there's one word that's very important in my life is reliability, and I feel like I'm giving that I'm giving that power to customers to give to their own. Um, so, what are the things? That, but the biggest challenge for them, and I, you know. I'll tell you a funny story. So there was one okay. summer, there was one summer I said, this is not fair, Marianne. You're in the business of providing this reliability to customers, but you only order from Amazon because Amazon Prime is reliable. I don't have time. I'm a busy single mom. I have so much on my plate. I don't have time to order something and then follow up and sit hours on the customer service line. So I, I ordered everything from Amazon Prime because I know it's going to get there and it's not going to waste my time. But I thought sure. to myself, I'm in the business of providing this tool to other non-Amazon customers. I want people to be in the market, to be able to compete, to sell with their own branding. So <clears throat> I need to get out there and stop using Amazon Prime for a whole summer. It was hard, <laughs> but <Sure>. I need to. <laughs> it was very hard, but I need to. I'm not going to name the brands, but I picked... All the, anything and everything that I, that I wanted to order that summer, and I went to order online. Well, guess what? I, more than 50% of them, I had to end up either at the store or with mm -hmm. customer service. And when I tried to dig in a bit more just because of my background, there was always an excuse. Oh, this is not us. It's UPS. This is not us. Mm -hmm. it's, it's inventory. This is, it was never them. And I hated that. I hated being a customer, listening to a vendor uh, telling me it's not them or I take ownership. Take ownership. It's you. So what we're big on, and if you, I, I wish you'd meet my whole team. I wish they were all here behind me because I speak on their behalf and they're all very caring, loving people who want to have their customers be reliable and they work day in and day out. We are 24 seven operation and our order management system is the glue. I, ours or any, I'm sure all other companies out there are providing that service, but you need a system that is able to track that and to be able to say it wasn't UPS, it was this. And the, mm. and the visibility needs to be at the higher up. Because guess what? If you're an employee, it's human nature. You make a mistake. You might fess up, you might not fess up. And it's always someone else's fault, right? So, sure. Or maybe it is, or maybe it's not. But does the executive at the higher level who's making these decisions have the visibility to see where did it fail? At what point? Yeah. Is it your order e-commerce? Is it your order management? Is it your inventory? And I think the key is in having that visibility so you can address it, right? So, yep. and it's, yep. it's having a system that gives you that dashboard and that visibility of, you know, we're often one system amongst 12 vendors around us. And so we're able to tell where, where did it fail? And it's always about not finger pointing, because I hate that, but about addressing, fixing the problem so that you get better and better and better. Does that help? You can't, <laughs> it does. You can't get better unless there's accountability and ownership of problems, mistakes. Yeah. Um, I was in the hospital. So for a long time, a lot of people may not know this. I was a nurse. I worked in open heart unit and, and uh, oh, wow. got trained in the other ICUs. And um, one of the things that I really liked that uh, at the hospital that I've brought to the agency world is uh, th this idea of, of no fault, uh, you know, you need to be able to, to, to have ownership over any problems. Um, because we look at these as process opportunities. Um, if there's an immediate worry of fault for something, then what do you do as a human t typically, yeah. then you're going to bury it, right? Now, think about it from a hospital's perspective. If you bury the, pro if somebody's, you know, leg gets amputated, the wrong leg, um, and you bury it because you're, you don't want to get, you know, in trouble for it or whatever this might be. 
um, you might not find out why did the wrong leg get amputated in the first place and how do we prevent this from happening again in the next time? Um, and so having this idea of this no fault policy where it's just a matter of, look, yeah, as long as you didn't, you know, intentionally screw up on purpose, um, you know, you're, you're just trying to do the wrong thing because you, yeah, you hate somebody or whatever, then there's no fault. There's an opportunity for process to be improved. And I think that's kind of what you're talking about with this accountability chart um, is, you know, with the dashboard, the ability to see, look, I'm not necessarily pointing a finger at you, UPS or DHL or, or <clears throat> um, picker, right? I'm simply saying I need to know where this problem is so we can fix it. And if it is a problem with our picking, then we can, we can address this. If it's a problem with one picker in particular, we can still address it. Maybe they weren't trained correctly, right? Whatever that yeah. it might be. And so you say, okay, let's, let's work through this. But it at least gives you the ability to figure out where the problem is to be able to fix that. And I think that's huge. I love that you gave the example of hospitals. And I didn't know that about you. I commend you for being that. It, it's, it's such a wonderful um, career as well. And nice that you <laughs> made a nice transition. Thanks. But uh, I, I, everyone thinks it's not life and death, then it's not important. Not true. Not true. It's sure. not about just like hospitals, a huge one. And I'm sure, I'm sure there's no visibility in most hospitals too. Who knows? But, um, but, but, you know, there's, there's two, exa- two things I can say to that. One is in my team, because I'm CEO and because I'm, I'm a bit of a feisty personality, I, I, you know, I'm super busy. I sometimes forget to put, you know, a, a, a kind word before I ask, why did this go sure. wrong? Um, everyone's like so busy, you know, no, it's, just, it's not me. It's, 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 and, and I always have to remind people, I, you know, as long as it's not intentional and as long as it didn't repeat, because when it does repeat means something wasn't visible in the first place, you mm-hmm. know, or, or there's someone not qualified enough, but then we can find where they're qualified. There's no problem. But we, the, the, in, the, the thing is we need to fix the problem. And one of the yeah. biggest common complaints I get with a lot of our customers, and it, the minute I hear it, I'm like, I'm irked, but I'm pleased. Is a lot of people in this business who are selling, you know, consumer goods come to me with, we hate our warehouse. We don't like our 3PL. We don't like the people who are shipping on it. They make mistakes. And I I say the same thing to all of them. And they're like, we're looking to switch. And I said to them, well, what work did you do in order to gain visibility of what their challenges are before you start switching? And if you have an order management solution that does the job for you, then you're able to understand, did you send too much? Do you have a contract with them? Do you know how many orders they can set, uh, ship out a day? Do you, do you have visibility of the inventory that they have? Have you ordered inventory properly and helped them out with that issue? Are you able to like make sure that they get the allocated number of orders that they can commit to shipping within a day? Mm-hmm. Or are you expecting them to do things they've never committed to? Like, how are you managing them? Or are you expecting them to manage you? But in my in my sure. books, I own the product, I own the business, I have ownership and accountability to help everyone else have the tools they need to support me. Right? I mean, I so I, I urge them to do all that homework first before they think of switching. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think that's that's huge because to your point, um, you may be you know, maybe even need to just upgrade your plan with, with whoever this is. And it's like, look, they're, they're maybe just not able to keep up with it because of your, your, you've tapped out from a plan perspective. Right. And it's like, you, you need to be able to, but the idea here is like, you need that visibility into the data you, you mentioned before. And I will say this is way outside of my realm of typical expertise, right? Like I'm much more on the marketing side. And so I might not even use the right terms, but you know, you talked about like load management and bundling, um, like, where did those come into play within this uh, issue and dynamic between the 3PL, the order management oh, system? And stuff? Lo- load is huge because you're looking at, am I, am I sending them 5,000 orders a day when they said they can only do four? Am yeah. I prior? And then I'm upset because the one most important order that needs to go out didn't go out. So did I help them prioritize? What, let's say the load is bigger and you're just trying to get as many possible and you try to get them to get overtime. Did you help them prioritize and say, these mm-hmm. are more important? Start your morning with these. Did you help them with, you know, there's, there's all sorts of expedited shipping and all that stuff. Like, so maybe the expedited shipping that they're trying to get out first is not as important to you as a bigger customer who has, who's a wholesale customer, has whatever it is. So that's one element. The other element is they might have, they might be bundling items for you. They might be pick and packing and putting 
items together, whether, so do you have the tools? Do you have the product? Like we have in our product set up the ability to create bundles or create, you know, multiple components into one item. How am I sending that to the warehouse? Am I sending it as one? Am I sending it as a multiple? Have I, at Boudin Bakeries, for example, in San Francisco, we used to give our warehouse predicted volumes before so that we could help them pre-bundle before that busy day so that on that busy day they're not bundling so how much of that planning and forecasting and visibility and you know are you partnering with your warehouse or are you just saying well, figure it out <laughs> that's huge because i think most people are just saying i'll oh, just figure it out like i've sent you yeah. the stuff and just like let it go and just and just handle it and and being able to partner with them i think is something that i haven't heard talked about a whole lot And when you talked about load management, it reminded me a lot of, uh, let's just say I go to Chipotle. This is the best example I could come up with. But it's like I go into Chipotle and I'm I'm ready to order my burrito or something, but they just got 30 online orders. Uh, And so from a prioritizing these things, well, it's like, well, maybe they're doing them. And I'm sitting here twiddling my thumbs. I'm like, look, I understand these came out in like a minute. I'm standing right here too sometimes, right? And it's like, can can you weave me in with some of the 30 here? So I'm not sitting here for the next half an hour uh, just waiting, waiting for, you know, my turn. Um, I can see where you'd say like, hey, maybe you prioritize the the customer that's there uh, in person a little bit more. And so similarly for what you're saying is there might be different types of orders that you're going to prioritize. Can you set rules or something to allow that uh, the warehouse to know which ones need to be prioritized? That way, the important ones aren't aren't missed if they do run into a load issue where, hey, of these 5,000, we only got these 4,000 out, but the important ones uh, were, were handled. I, I you know... I love the example you gave. It's exactly a huge source of frustration for me. I go to a restaurant or I go somewhere and I'm sitting there waiting. I made the effort to get in the car and to drive and to come. Sure. You're paying rent. I'm helping you facilitate the cost of the table that you're paying for because I'm sitting right here, but you're prioritizing the orders coming out from before. So the question is, mm-hmm. does the person managing this, does the manager or the executive or whatnot, have that visibility. Do they, they have I'm sure the they knowledge? Don't. Right. I'm sure they don't. That's why I'm telling you, most right. people are just relying on these weekly meetings with their managers, with non, you know, they have KPIs and they have metrics, but do they have the right ones? Right. They have a huge amount of volume that went out and then they have the mistakes that happened or the mm-hmm. unhappy customers. Or, you know, we, we go on to custom, you know, our prospects' websites. The minute we see someone's unhappy, you know, customers unhappy about delivery or whatnot, we know that there is a place for us to go speak to people because I'm guessing that they don't even know why that customer was unhappy. Yeah. The, you right. know, they might say, oh, customers are unhappy. They couldn't wait five minutes. Well, what can you do to make it better? What can yeah. you do to make it better? Look at McDonald's. I love McDonald's. McDonald's is an institution. They've done a great job. McDonald's yeah. is, I was hired at um, Boudin Bakery. They had old point of sales. And they would like take forever to like click on that and couldn't look at the customer in the eye. And the goal was, if you want this to grow, it has to be very easy. They need to be able to order, look at your face, smile. And there needs to be a red ticket that's sounding alarms if this order took more than three minutes. So the management Mm. was very caring about it has to be delivered. And look at if you next time you go to McDonald's, you see that they have those tickets. They turn yellow, green, green, yellow, and then red ones. And then they start flashing and that's sure. the metrics that everyone's being evaluated on because someone had to wait. And sure. you go through their drive through and same thing. They're super fast. So they ha- there is a yeah. way. You just have to be – and Amazon does it. So there is Amazon a way. Amazon does it. Amazon yeah. Does. And so what else should we know about uh, like j- just order bot and order management that um, – could help us do a better job. Let's say that somebody is thinking, okay, you, you've got me sold. This makes sense. Um, what are the first steps that they should be looking at to getting started to making sure that they are partnering correctly with you in their warehouse? I always say self-awareness, really. Honestly, it's like the yeah. and communication. It's the hardest thing for us when we meet a prospect is to understand their business. So, we're not a typical SaaS where you come in and you just start using our software and, and there's no support and handhold. People are asking us a ton of questions. It's, it's not an easy setup. You have to put your products, you have to enter customers, your inventory. Um, you have a certain process. You have your values in your company. The more you're aware, and very often we find that the person making the decision to buy 
and then the people actually <laughs> implementing are living two different lives. So yeah. we'll come in and we'll make commitments based on what we he hear from the decision makers. But if it's not in line with what the, the problems and the solutions, like the issues really are in the business. And yes, granted, we're here to solve that. But there's, again, there is the willingness to be able to say, okay, I made a mistake. I didn't give you the right problem. Let's, it's mm -hmm. software at the end of the day. You can't just like, you know, and, um, and work together as a partner to make sure that we get to the end goal. Because the end goal is to give you that awareness that you didn't know when you called and you yeah. said, I need this. So just, just to be okay with the fact that you might have asked for something <laughs> without checking with your team or without really knowing, or you haven't been on the floor recently. Um, mm. And then, you, you know, there's a lot of people who haven't been on the floor recently. It's like and the then, undercover boss show. You yes. remember that one? Yeah. Right? Where it's like they'd have to go and actually like be on the floor and doing that work and they're undercover to see how it's done. And they get out there and it's like they're scrambling and failing. And they're like, wow, I didn't realize how hard it was to do this, this or this. And maybe yeah. there's room for me to improve this here now. I think it's so important. And I was chatting with one of my teams yesterday, team members yesterday, and she said, are you talking to everyone in the team still? I said, I am just undercover. <laughs> it's just like, yeah. I find my ways. It's so important. My, my, my uh, brother, my younger brother uh, got a job with Bell Canada once. And it was all about undercover being hired as one of these customer service reps who sure. like was there undercover and who had to give a report to him. And I admire that because, and you know, maybe he was so young and he couldn't maybe understand everything, but I, I would have been like, I'm an executive. I want to come sit and take calls and take orders. I want, I want to sit and be there and do pick packing. I want to go sit with my warehouse. Mm -hmm. I want to, and then understand the problems and then say, okay, that's what we need. Um, yeah. So, but that's, that's my way of doing things. <laughs> you mentioned a success with Harry Styles uh, and being able to like handle a massive amount of orders all at once. What are, what are some other successes? And, and you even talked about, you know, taking somebody from 80% to 99.8%. What are some other examples of successes like that, that you feel like you can talk about where somebody comes and they, they, they get started using you and you say, wow, this is the clear evidence that we are, you are, we, we're paying for ourselves by doing this, right? So yeah. like uh, from an ads perspective, it's very easy for me to be able to prove that it's like, look, as a result of the advertising that we did and the management fee, your EBITDA went up by this amount. Like we've, we've more than paid for ourselves. What are those highlights and how do you show that for what you're doing? So we have, I have so many stories. I can, I can talk about this forever, but I'll tell you a couple. Um, today we're working, I was just talking to one, one of our first customers has been with us for 12 years now. His name is Greg Alzheimer. He runs National Sporting Goods in uh, New Jersey. I've met him many times, had great moments with him. He has a you know, multinational business, which has you know, EDI orders that come through. Sure. He has wholesale bid orders to the Nordstrom and Macy's and you, know, you name it. Um, he, he then, you know, with, with the help of us, he got onto Shopify to order B2C. Um, and it, it's just been such a pleasure to watch, you know, Greg has a phenomenal attitude of partnership is the minute there's a problem, I'm going to call you and I'm not going to be mad and I'm going to be sitting there and let's solve it together. But you watch their numbers grow like drastically in 12 years. And, you know, and, and we're part of this. We're part of enabling this growth yeah. that, a, that, a you know, wholesaler in New Jersey. I, and I feel it's not because of the system only. I think it's because there's a problem and we're here. There's a team behind it that helps you. We're a bit different because we have a bit of a consulting element with us. Um, but I can tell you stories and stories. We have another customer, Chive, like he's now an Atlanta gift show. He started, when we started with him, he was, I don't know, I can't even tell the numbers, but they were tiny numbers and it's grown and grown. We've, we've, we've been there to watch him. Today he's, he got awarded the, the largest um 3,000 square foot of trade show to show his product. And I was just wow. living on the phone the other day and I was like, oh, how, how amazing to be, like we had the customer, one of our first customers, Wishbone Bikes, international, all, all over the world. They were like um, selling in England, selling in New Zealand, selling uh, in North America. We met them, they were just like, you know, 
less than a hundred thousand dollars in sales. And like you, yeah. you, 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 you get to witness seeing 50,000 to $20 million in sales. I, I can't tell you how much joy that brings to me. It's, yeah. uh, it's, it's, you're part of not one business growth, but many, 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 many business growth. Yeah. No, that's good. And I love seeing that. And you're, you're beaming. You're literally, if, you know, for, if somebody's listening and not watching, you're, you're literally beaming from ear to ear. Like I can tell that this joy uh, that you get from this is, is very real and, and, and that's encouraging, um, which is a good time for me to transition. I'd like to talk a little bit about like, who is Marianne Zachauer then as well? So it's like getting to know you. Um, what was it like for you growing up uh, and, and how did that contribute to the woman that you are today? So, William, I grew up in Dubai, um, and when my father got to Dubai in 1960s, it was like a desert. I remember him telling me that I took a bus to school and it was a 20-minute ride, but I remember him telling me it was a whole day ride to get to where my school would have been when he landed. So, But one of the very particular things about Dubai, and I think the whole world knows about its growth, um, sure is that when you live there, when it's semi-desert still, there was nothing when I was there. There was no movie theaters. There was, there was, you, there was the beach and a couple of hotels, and you could only go to restaurants and drink at hotels. But because we've been there for such a long time, my father, my parents, my mom, were, they were part of the community that helped this town grow. So at our dinner table or lunch or every weekend, it was, it was time with those who built all the highways and those who built all the buildings and those who ir did the irrigation systems. And, and it was just, you know, you'd sit there and I, you know, there were so many, so many kids. My parents had so many friends and it's the family that was always busy, you know, hosting each other and friendships. I, I couldn't help myself, but be attracted to go sit where the men were. I mean, you know, my dad would tell us all these stories mm -hmm. and my dad was very big on like independent women and, um, and I'd go sit there and I'd want to listen to those stories. And they all looked at me and said, like, don't you have a Barbie to go play with? Oh, you go play with your dolls. And why are you asking those questions? And they, you know, most of the men were not that encouraging on like, you sure. know, so I, I think I had this in me where I'm like, I, I want to achieve these big things. These people are achieving. And why are they shutting me down? I, I don't think I really understood at the time, but it took me a while to understand that, you know, they had, you know, my family would have loved me to like, get married to a very wealthy guy and, you know, live more comfortably and not choosing the harder path. But I love sure. the challenge. <laughs> well, and, and, and I think you're doing what inspires and encourages you and energizes you. And I think that's huge and that's important. And it's funny that you brought up Barbie of all things too, because there's actually a really good commercial from Barbie. And I don't know if you remember this commercial. I don't know if you even saw it, but it's one of my favorite commercials that's ever been made by any company uh, where they show, um, I, I think if I remember correctly, there's this little girl and she's uh, in the doctor's office and she's wearing the lab coat and like explaining what's going on and, and ex, you know, discussing stuff. And then, and then it shows her like giving a lecture at the university and oh, then it shows wow. her doing like all of these other things. I love it. And then, and then it transitions and it's not actually that girl doing that. And it shows that it's like, she's actually playing with her Barbie dolls, imagining that she's doing that. And it's oh, like, oh, I get goosebumps wow, every time. That it's does just, give me goosebumps. Yeah, but that imaginative play of, like you said, it's like you had dreams, you had goals, and you're like, I want to sit here and listen to the people who are doing these things and saying, I'm going to do that one day. And, and here you are. And you're like, yeah, I did it. I'm an entrepreneur. I've built this company. Um, and just congratulations. That's really cool. Thank you. Thank you. You know, I'll, I'll tell you something no one knows about me, but I grew up wishing I was a boy. And then I was, one day it hit me and I'm like, why am I wishing I'm a boy? Yes, I get it. Mother, mo motherhood is difficult when you have, I don't know, there's, there's certain emotions that comes with carrying a baby and some men have it, some don't, some women have it, some don't like, you know, but, yeah, uh, totally. But I, I just was like, oh, juggling this, you know, parenthood and, and business and it was not easy. But you know what? It doesn't mean I should have been a boy. It just means that I can do it and I just need to believe that yeah. I can. You know? yeah. And I think that's beautiful, too. I know for a while we're, we're going way off topic, but I love it because that's what this is about. You know, for a while uh, it was being a girl, you were not allowed to like pink. Um, it yeah. was funny as my girls uh, when we decorated my oldest's uh, bedroom. It was all from World Market. There wasn't an ounce of pink in her room, really. Um, it was just very eclectic. And, and I can remember as soon as she was able to pick what she wanted, everything was pink. Um, but then when she goes to school, it's almost like, oh, you like pink? You. Like, you're not allowed to like pink. Like, girls can't like pink anymore. It's like, you have to like teal or 
black or something else. And it was like, we went to this opposite direction for a little while, I think, where it was like, you weren't allowed to be a girl and also still like girly things. And I think the idea here is it's like, look, as a girl, you can just say, I, I like black or blue or pink or green or gray or yellow or whatever. And that's okay. You can say, I want to be the girl who wants to grow up to <laughs> be a doctor or the girl who wants to grow up to be an entrepreneur or the girl who wants to grow up and be a mom. Yeah. Those are all okay paths. Yes. Yes. And you know, I, you know, in my family, there's everything. There's the, you know, yeah. one brother married a radiologist and another mar brother married a lovely, lovely woman who, who takes care of herself and does sports and has a huge Instagram following and, and takes care of the house to young girls that are doing great. And I feel like I fought it. I fought it for the, I, I, it's so funny you bring up the pink example because I kept saying, I hate pink. I never yeah. hated pink. I just didn't want to like pink. I didn't want to be a girl. <laughs> and yeah. I remember till this day, the day where that switched. And I said, it's okay mm -hmm. to wear pink. I'm going to be proud because, yeah. and maybe it took me accomplishing certain things to say, Hey, sure. I'm a woman and I did it. And I'm going to wear pink today because it's okay. <laughs> that's good I'm, I'm i actually came home and celebrated that to tell you the truth <laughs> that's really good you should celebrate that yeah, yeah um what about uh if i was in the office with you what you know you mentioned some things that i learned about you but what else would i learn about you being in person with you that i i can't necessarily see or experience uh just over this call <laughs> so it's funny because everyone says Oh, Marianne's here. Her laugh is around. So mm -hmm. it's, and they all imitate my laugh and they all make, fun, you know, tease me about my laugh. And they're all like, oh, she's not here. We didn't hear her laugh today. And I, I, I feel like if I'm going to be at the office and I miss those days terribly because no one wants to yeah. go back to the office and I'm having to kind of do things to force people to show up sometimes. But it, it's, it was the most beautiful days ever to have everyone in the company. And now the company's bigger. So it's all, and all over the place as well. So it's harder, sure. but, but there was my laugh that they all laughed about. And then one big signature item of Marianne is we're all having lunch together. So mm -hmm. at least twice a week, we're, we're ordering food for everyone and we're having lunch because, you know, we talked about being on the floor the other day, but when you sit around, we have a big, huge, kitchen table. And when you all sit around the table and talk, and some might come the first half an hour, some might come after, some might come 10 minutes, but, and just talk about their day and look at the look in their face. Are they happy? Yeah. Are they not happy? Everyone's drawn to food. I love food to death. Like it's one of my, I've always wanted to Me marry. Too. Yeah. I can't, I can't go in day without like everyone does this intermittent fasting and like doesn't eat for, I don't know how long. And I'm like, no, 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 no. I look forward <laughs> to every meal of my day. I'm not skipping any. But I, I, I feel it's the secret behind the bond we've all created in the office. So yeah. food <laughs> and smiles I, and giggles and laughs. <laughs> I, I love that. I mean, that's such a positive culture then that you are creating. And um, I'm right there with you on food. I love food. Um, and the laughing, though, that's a good one. Who do you get your laugh from then? Is it your you know, mom, your dad, grandma, well, grandpa? My, my mom is a very feisty, smart woman who... You know, I, I remember growing up with her, you know, my wiseness is from my dad, but my, my mom is this, like, everything is possible. Like, don't mm. ever, and she has this ability to manifest things. Like, I remember going, you know, we'd go into very busy parking lots and she'd be like, I'm going to go and I'm going to find a place right in front of the entrance and she'd find it. I don't know. And then there was some very, very big challenges. She worked. So this was very different for a woman in Abu Dhabi, she just liked to be around people and didn't want to be the stay at home mom. So I think I get some of it from her and worked with like embassies and was always an executive right hand person for someone, but uh, made things impossible. She'd come home and tell us these stories about how very yeah. bright senior people would try something and couldn't do it. And they'd come to her and she'd figure it out. So she's always laughing, always laughing as well. But so yeah, maybe my mom and my dad. So I'm a bit of both. My brothers are a lot of fun. We have a very fun dynamic at home. So that's cool. Well, and and if I remember correctly, you were talking about uh, you you also speak French and Arabic in addition to English, right? Like, is there any yeah. other languages that I need to know about? I'm dying to get back to my Spanish because I absolutely adore the culture. My son's in Spain yeah. on the beach in Valencia as we speak, but uh, or maybe it's a bit late and he finished now and eating paella somewhere, but. Oh, I love man. the Spanish language. I feel like it's uh, it comes with 
you know, uh, more aromas, nice music. I, I love dancing. So, yeah, uh, oh, I, I can understand it all. You can speak to me, ask me all the questions in Spanish. I'd just be challenged right now. I haven't practiced the answer, but yeah. Well, I should have I should have started our podcast off by asking you uh, either Sava or it is the afternoon, so I could have said Masa Ukher, right? There's many there other go. ways that I could have started this off. You do a great job, William. Appreciate it. So uh, what about um, other hobbies or things, you know, what, is, what are your hobbies? What do you get excited about just on a daily basis? My passion and where I'm going to retire is on a boat somewhere, so... Something that I don't know if anyone knows about me, but I used to be a racer in cars and boats. Uh, oh. at, at 17, we used to race boats in Dubai on the on the waters. And then what kind of boats? Like uh, oh, speed boats. I, it's speed yeah. boats. Yeah, speed boats. My friends had boats. I wasn't allowed, so no one knew. None of my family members knew I was on the boats. But I did a Slug lot of things away. that I wasn't allowed <laughs> to do. And then in university in Montreal, there was no boats. So it was cars. So we'd, I'd spend my weekends with, again, boys souping up like small cars and putting, lowering the suspensions and changing them yeah. and, and then going to drag races. I love speed and I need adrenaline. <laughs> every birthday of mine, I go to Vegas and I get on those racetracks with a f new car every time. So, you know, I... I you know, my brother was laughing at me the other day and he's like, can you live with that risk in your life? <laughs> <laughs> no, but that's good, right? Like you need that. I, I can certainly appreciate that. And I would say that that's maybe even another sign of an entrepreneur is you, you need a little bit of that adrenaline in your life. Um, we were talking earlier before the show here. Uh, I, I was um, spent some time up at the Apostle Islands this past weekend with my wife. We were celebrating our 14th uh, wedding anniversary. And uh, I did not race boats, but I'm getting to the boat part of this story. Um, I grew up in, in the inner city. There was no boating for where I grew up. But um, there, were, there was a, a – uh, oh, what, I'm drawing a blank on the name here right now. <laughs> the boats with sails, sailboats. I just yeah. for some reason struggled with it. There was a sailboat regatta there, uh, and uh, they, were, they, were, they were racing. And I was walking back along the dock the one day, and they were like, hey – uh, do you want to race with us tomorrow? And I'm like, you know, like, why? Why are you just randomly asking me? And I see the sign and they basically just needed another person because it was a little bit choppy out there or whatever. Uh, they needed another person out there to kind of help balance things out as they were, you know, going around the turns and stuff. And so it said that they were just looking for somebody over 200 pounds. And so I almost got to race <laughs> in a sailboat simply because of my weight there. Uh, but oh, I think that's you? amazing that you got did to you go? No, no, no. Well, why no, because it was we were headed back that day to go pick up our kids. And so it was oh. one of those things where I was like, oh, any other time I would have said yes. But, you know, my wife and I we were looking at it, it was just like, we've got babysitters. We've already been relying on them for a couple of days. It's like, I can't take the next six hours and go out there. Like, well, we're, well we're, you should have. Have you been I in a know. race? A regatta? I used to do regattas in San Francisco all the time. No, I haven't. And I, you I did? Didn't, yeah, I didn't do a day. It's a funny story with my ex-husband. We were both fanatics. So my, my plan to retire was to go in Europe between Greece, Italy, South Africa, in the Mediterranean mm, and live yeah. on a boat with nothing. I want no belongings, just live on a boat and go Beautiful. from port to port. I have to see land. I don't want to not see land. I'm not one of these, but I want to go because I need the food and I need, sure. you know, the, the life and the party and whatever. So, and, but I, you know, he was like, I'll go, we want to buy a boat. So I'll go take all the certificates and I'll go do all this. And I'm like, okay, you, you go do that. And we did all these regattas. And then one day the captain comes to me and says, I am promoting you. And I said, to what? And he's like, to a tactician. I said, why? He's like, you're always the one strategizing and telling us mm. how to win the I said, when did I do that? He said, he started giving me all these examples. I, I hadn't even paid attention. I'd be like, Greg, you need to go this way. And Greg's like, but that's the longer way. I'm like, yeah, but that's the way that's going to make us win. And we'd follow. And that's what I loved about him is he that's took the cool. chance on me. He followed and someone was telling me the other day, I don't like sailboats. They go like this. I like speedboats. They're super. <laughs> yeah. But that's the thrill of a sailboat. I love it yeah. when they're going like this and I'm sitting on the tip and the wind's coming in my face. It's, I yeah. love the water. You can tell. I like absolutely love the water. That's good. Well, I yes. hope that that uh, dream comes true here for you one day when you retire. I hope so. Um, Maybe you'll, you'll come join since you like boats too. <laughs> I, I would love to be the one jumping back and forth across there, throwing my weight around to help keep Your us from going Your kids will be right older. <laughs> Your yes. kids will be older too. And <laughs> yeah. Um, if if uh, people wanted to stay in touch with you, work with you, what's the best way for them to reach out? 
anything. I think, um, you know, I'm at OrderBot. You can find me on LinkedIn. I'm not very quick. There's so much junk these days on LinkedIn that it's hard. But if the message is, you know, a bit not marketing or salesy, I'll, I'll get to it. Um, my email is, I'm happy to share my email or even myself with anyone. Marianne at orderbot.com. Uh, reach out anytime and we can just chat. It can be just a chit chat. I love it. Cool. <laughs> I really appreciate it, Marianne. You've been very uh, helpful and just fun to get to know here today. And uh, I hope you have a great rest of your day today. This was lots of fun. Thank you for this opportunity, William. Great chatting with you. Likewise. And thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Have a great day. Take care. Thanks for listening to the Up Arrow podcast with William Harris. We'll see you again next time. And be sure to click subscribe to get future episodes.